And I'm Cody Nelson. And this is the state of Minnesota. A new study claims that restaurants in the Minneapolis airport have the least amount of healthy food options for vegans. Those options being bagels, ketchup packets, or a ticket to Portland. <laughs> <laughs> Blake Monster Brewing Company opened their latest tap room in St. Paul, finally giving bearded white men a place to complain. <laughs> the Como Zoo in St. Paul recently started a reindeer cam where viewers can keep an eye on Santa's little helpers 24-7, or as it's called any other month of the year, putting a GoPro on an elk. <laughs> Roseville hosted the National Speed Skating Championship last week, and boy, did the stars show up. There was Apollo Ono, and uh, everybody just showed up. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, it was great. After the Minnesota Twins signed Byung Ho Park, the team president said he sees a lot of possibilities in the South Korean slugger. And yeah, they're endless. I mean, throwing the ball, uh, catching the ball, hitting, <laughs> hitting the ball really far, hitting the ball less far if that's what the team needs, uh, showing Joe Maurer kimchi. <laughs> Duluth is repurposing an, an abandoned quarry into an 100 foot high ice climbing wall because the city was sick of everyone associating Duluth with being warm and flat. <laughs> An MSU Mankato student has made national news by creating a bucket list for her terminally ill dog. Highlights from the list include being a good boy, getting a treat, and backpacking through Thailand. <laughs> a vocal jazz ensemble from St. Olaf, Olaf plans a tour to Cuba March of 2016. Finally, we have justified reasons to have diplomatic relations with those guys. Gah! That took... Forever. The St. Paul City Council will vote next week on a resolution that would declare Donald Trump unwelcome. But Minnesota unwelcome isn't that bad. He's still allowed within city limits. People will just like give him a medium coffee if he orders a large <laughs> and like forget his burger didn't have tomatoes. It's basically, it's basically just poor service at diners, I guess. <laughs> a semi-truck overturned an I-94 spilling thousands of potatoes onto the highway. Meanwhile, an Idaho crime syndicate is losing their mind because somebody in Minnesota botched the job. The Minnesota Timberwolves blew an 18-point lead to the Denver Nuggets in overtime last week. That headline again, Minnesota played sports. <laughs> the Twin Cities police are looking for a man in Fridley who discharged his gun in a Target. And I hate to victim blame here, but with a logo like that? <laughs> Adele just announced a 2016 North American tour, her first in five years. And the XL Energy Center is the first stop. Uh, don't worry about buying tickets, though. I just heard from Mom, and she says that Grandpa got enough for everybody. I guess Katie's even coming home from school for it. That'll be like really fun to have everybody in the same room. I think our church is doing some kind of shuttle bus thing. Maybe we can do that to avoid park. I'm getting tired of the joke. I'm just trying to say Adele appeals to everybody. <laughs> I mean, it's Adele. Hello. Oh. Uh, I'm not really. uh, yesterday, it was the last day of Hanukkah, or as many Minnesotans call it, mid-December. Uh, once again, I'm Cody Nelson. And I'm Aaron Wildes Lassie. That was the state of Minnesota. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Minnesota tonight. Minnesota tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Tonight we'll be talking about police brutality. Like hip hop, police brutality is something people of color have known about for a long time, but has since become popular for white people to talk about. It's essentially the Macklemore of social issues. And just like Macklemore, it is tearing communities apart. Even here in Minnesota, 
up until the recent Black Lives Matter protests at the 4th Precinct, many white Minnesotans did not think that police brutality was an issue in our state. And according to the residents of Maple Grove, it still isn't. <laughs> Since 1854, when the first Minnesotan Police Department was established in St. Paul, we have called upon police to protect us from violence, theft, challenging intersections, and to inspire our best male strippers. <laughs> For a long time, we have put our trust in police officers to protect us from ourselves. We trust officers enough to even give them a gun, a baton, and a mustache. <laughs> and we assume that they will use these things for good, despite the fact that anyone with a mustache and a baton looks crazy evil. <laughs> Yet, as we learn from M. Night Shyamalan, people we trust can hurt us over and over again. I mean, how can you make us watch The Last Airbender? Sixth Sense was a masterpiece. <laughs> and much like Shyamalan's movies, this has never made any sense, but we still make excuses for it. And unfortunately, we only tend to take notice when confronted when people die from police violence. Usually, these are what the media call, uh, have come to call um, officer-involved shootings, a phrase that carefully evades placing blame on the officer who shot somebody. The most recent of these incidents was the murder of Jamar Clark an unarmed African-American man who was shot and killed by police officer Mark Ringenberg just four weeks ago. Jamar's death is one of many high-profile police shootings that have galvanized movements for police reform and racial justice. But it was in no way the first police shooting in Minnesota. According to a recent report by the Star Tribune, at least 141 people in Minnesota have been killed by police since the year 2000. For contrast, only 57 people have died falling through ice since 2000. And we live in a state filled with lakes. <laughs> and it says a lot about our state that we have charged an equal number of police officers as we have lakes for the, these deaths. Zero. A closer look at the report reveals persistent disparities in exactly who gets killed. While black people only make up uh, approximately 6% of the population in Minnesota, they make up 30% of those killed by police. Asian and Native Minnesotans are also killed by police at higher rates than whites. Police killings are just the fruit of the grotesque tree of police brutality in Minnesota, which coincidentally tastes a lot like honeydew. Because like honeydew, <laughs> police brutality be is a despicable and overly prevalent in our fruit salad society. Fuck you, honeydew, you garbage fruit of injustice. <laughs> garbage fruit. Most cases of police brutality come from inappropriate conduct or language, harassment, excessive force, discrimination, retaliation, or even theft. Nowhere is this more clear than Minnesota's largest city of Minneapolis. This May, a Minneapolis police officer named Michael Griffin was indicted on federal charges after he violently assaulted two men in nightclubs and lied to investigators about the incident. Michael Griffin had previously 22 complaints, with only one sustained by the Minneapolis Department of Police. In total, the city paid $410,000 to those Griffin abused. We shouldn't be surprised because Minneapolis has been paying victims at such a high rate that you would think they're a distant father trying to buy their children's love. <laughs> Let's take a look. When allegations of police misconduct move from the street to the courtroom, more often than not, Minneapolis has to pay. CARE 11 requested numbers from the city of Minneapolis and found since January 2010, Minneapolis has dealt with 141 officer conduct lawsuits. The city won 51 of them, either at trial or when a judge dismissed the case. But the city had to pay money in 90 of those cases, settling 86 times and losing four trials. In that time, Minneapolis has paid $10.7 million for officer conduct lawsuits. That includes two years, 2011 and 2013, when the city had to pay more than $4 million each year. $10.7 million. Man, that's a fuckload of money. <laughs> when confronted with that information, you can make one of two assumptions. You can either assume that Minneapolis police are wrongfully attacking a lot of innocent people, or you could assume that Minneapolis police are wrongfully attacking a smaller number, 
a smaller number of innocent people with Fabergé eggs. <laughs> <laughs> but even when you thought things were hopeless, Care 11 was sure to add a little silver lining. Minneapolis's numbers don't look so bad when compared to Chicago, which paid $54.2 million just last year for officer misconduct litigation. Really? All we have to say for ourselves is that at least we're not Chicago. <laughs> Chicago has an entire musical about committing murder in Chicago. <laughs> Titled Chicago. <laughs> All Minneapolis has is the Mary Tyler Moore Show. <laughs> At least we're not Chicago. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's been this way for way too long. Since the early 90s, the number of reported cases of excessive force by Minneapolis police has stayed stagnant. The key word is reported, because many victims of police brutality are not especially interested in asking the same group of people who just beat them up for justice. And no wonder. Imagine if your teacher called you stupid, and when you tried to report it, the principal said, that's just how you are. That's how we do it here at Glendale Elementary. John, you are stupid. <laughs> you deserve to be called stupid, and we aren't going to punish your teacher because she's just doing her job. Did I mention you are stupid? <laughs> most of us have, most have good reason to not trust that their case will be given much merit. Separate audits of St. Paul and Minneapolis citizen review systems showed a systematic bias that favored accused police officers. Even now in Minneapolis, the Office of Police Conduct Review, the group responsible for responding to police allegations, dismisses nearly half of the cases they receive and rarely punishes officers uh, uh, responsible. Between 2008 and 2014, there were more than 2,000 complaints against police officers. In that time, only 70 officers were suspended for their actions and only 12 were fired from the force. The rest were referred to mediation or internal coaching, which I can only assume after watching a lot of 1980s cop movies, involves a cop placing his gun and badge on the table for being a loose cannon and then getting him back by the end of the movie. <laughs> Yet Minneapolis residents are not bearing the brunt of police brutality equally. Victims are disproportionately people of color, mainly living in, in communities like North, North Minneapolis. This is partly because the police who, protect, who are hired to protect Minneapolis are overwhelmingly not as diverse as the people living in Minneapolis. In fact, 94% of Minneapolis police don't even live in Minneapolis. The Minneapolis Police Department's motto is to protect with courage and serve with compassion. It's hard to do that when the people you are required to protect and serve are complete strangers. It doesn't need to be this way. Minneapolis can solve these problems, but it won't happen unless we take drastic steps to hold our police departments accountable for their action. One way to do that is to give police officers an incentive to avoid misconduct. One nonprofit named the Committee for Professional Policing has proposed a ballot measure that, if passed in November 2016, would require Minneapolis police officers to have professional liability insurance. If an officer receives substantial complaints about abuse or excessive force, their insurance premiums would go up. Eventually, cops who receive many individual complaints, like Michael Griffin did, would become uninsurable, and other more respectful and professional officers would replace them. This is not a radical concept. We already require surgeons and lawyers and even accountants to carry malpractice insurance, but for some reason, not the only profession that requires a gun, baton, and a mustache. <laughs> As of last year, the measure was only 1,000 signatures away from getting on the ballot in 2016. <laughs> Go to www.insurethepolice.org to find out more ways you can help make Minneapolis the first city to require uh, police to carry professional liability insurance and help end police brutality. Thank you very much. That was MN10.
a community organizer with Neighborhoods Organizing for Change, and thank you for being here. No problem. Thanks for staying down with me. I, I just have to say I'm very impressed because I've never organized anything in my life. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I disorganize things. My presence alone, like, um, yeah, so thank you for, no for doing the organizing work. Yeah, you and me both. You should see my office. <laughs> so to be an organizer, you don't have, an, have to have an organized office? To be an organizer, like most of us are completely unorganized. I mean, we organize for work, and then when we go home, we're just like, throw this here, throw that here. <laughs> um, ah, yeah. I see. We see, just, leave work at work, right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Wash your shoes in the sink, you know? We need for this, being a sprite kid. Yeah. <laughs> We've all done it. We've all done it. We've all. Long road trips. <laughs> right. <laughs> like a road trip at home, right? We never use my bathroom. <laughs> All right, let's get right into it. So can you tell us what, what is the mission of Neighborhoods Organizing for Change? The mission of or, uh, Neighborhoods Organizing for Change, we're, um, we're a racial and economic justice organization. So we focus on um, bringing resources to under-resourced under -resourced communities, especially communities of color. Um, and not we, um, I would like to say we have to say that um, we are, um, we are unapologetically black. We are black from the top down. You know what I mean? And I think that's really important in doing this work because for so long, um, there were basically white people <laughs> doing jobs that black people should, should have been out here on the ground doing the work and getting paid for it. So, I, so our organization really focuses a lot on bringing people from those under-resourced communities and, um, and like not developing them, but building them up. <laughs> and um, making sure that they are part of this political process. They are part of um, everything from elections to um, holding police officers accountable to um, um, improving education. So um, that, that, those are the main areas we focus on, specifically um, voting rights. Like in the state of Minnesota, there's 40,000 people um, who are felons who can't vote or don't know they can't vote. So that's one big thing we've been focused on, going back and forth to the Capitol. Um, nudging Governor Dayton to like let people vote. Um, another thing we focus on is um, police accountability, which you've seen, <laughs> which you've seen in the news a lot these last couple weeks. Yeah. So uh, how has Knock been involved? Uh, and I imagine you're referring to the Justice for Jamar yes. protest at the Fort Precinct. Well, how has Knock been involved in that process? Um, we we've done actually a few things. Um, once once. Uh, I got to shout out the um, the queer led, the queer women led movement of Black Minneapolis, Black Lives Matter Minneapolis. Um, once they took the precinct and refused to leave without um, the tapes from the incident being released, uh, we like everybody in my office like activated. We were like, this is what we have to do. Um, there's no there's no like step back. We like put everything on the back burner, and we actually sent um, a few of our a few of our um, staff members down there to help out with um, crowd control, bringing donations in and setting up. Um, another thing we did, we, <laughs> we opened up the knock office um, for a safe space, a healing space where people could come, where we had barbers come in, give um, community members free haircuts. Um, also, we had masseuses come in and give out free massages. <laughs> so um, we just wanted to make sure that um, through everything that was going on, that people were healing and people were all right. Um, those are just a few of the things we did for healing. We also brought in people from all across the country. Uh, 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 Reverend Seku from um, Fellowship of Reconciliation, he came here uh, to teach about civil disobedience. He did a um, civil disobedience training with a bunch of community members. And you got to remember, these are people who really haven't um, been organized or been any part of the political process. So it was like awakening um, the fire in these people to like make change in their communities and know that they are powerful too. Um, another person we brought in uh, was Watanye Tiembre, who, cool fun fact, he was Tupac's manager. What? Yeah. So I didn't he know He came to Minnesota? Yeah. He came to yeah. Minnesota? Yeah, and he led a security train. Wait, did he tell you where Tupac is secretly living? <laughs> yeah, man, Tupac had coffee like two weeks ago. What? Yeah. But, you went all the way to Australia to have coffee with him? Oh, no, it's not Australia. You really like a spaceship, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
Well, <laughs> but we'll talk after. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he came and he did a security training um, to make sure that the fourth precinct and how it was occupied that everybody remained safe. Because um, I'm sure you sure you heard that um, five white supremacists came and shot five um, community members. Now, I would like to call those guys heroes because those guys um, knew that those white supremacists were up to something. They didn't know what, but they used all their energy to push them back away from the crowd where there were children, there were elderly folk, and anybody or anything could have, anybody who got hurt, anything could have happened. So those guys are like really heroes. They like literally took bullets to protect um, protect the community. So I like to shout those guys out because it was just amazing. And through them getting shot, we've actually, um, we've been trying to make sure that they can reestablish their lives. So Nock has been reaching out to the, to the victims of the shooting and, making, and just making sure whatever they need, we can help you out with that. We've just been trying to make sure that everybody gets a chance to heal from this situation because in the black community, um, there's a thing there's a thing called trauma. Like we deal, with, we deal with like so much trauma um, from like being economically disenfranchised in, in the state of Minnesota to like police killing us to like not getting a job interview because of the color of our skin. So like having the opportunity meant the world. So what would you say for the average viewer who is um, wondering when? Uh, Prairie Home Companion will come back on and how they got to this point in the internet. Uh, so for an average viewer of this show, or for our audience, our studio audience, what, what can they do to support uh, police accountability measures and um, generally the mission of NOC um, to, to make a more equitable uh, Twin Cities and more accountable police force? I would, I would think first and foremost, um, know your rights. Know what police can and can't do to you, and, and and like, like make sure that they know that you know your rights when you're pulled over by the police, when you're stopped on the street. Make sure that they know, record everything you can, because what you don't record will be something that will be needed in court the next week. Um, second of all, um, Knock has started a petition um, asking for no grand jury for. Um, Mark Ringenberg um, and allow direct prosecution, just like anybody else in this room. If we killed somebody, we would be sitting in a courtroom um, judged by a jury of our peers. And I think that is very important for um, um, for like the whole of the police accountability to make sure that the grand jury doesn't get a chance to touch this case. Because as we know, 97% um, of the time, the grand jury returns a non-guilty verdict for police. So uh, signing that petition, which is on mnnoc.org, um, that's one thing you can do. Um, also, call Kurt Doubt, um, the, sen the state speaker, um, the speaker of the house, and, and ask him to call a special session for um, the north side of Minneapolis, and specifically the racial disparities here in Minnesota. Um, within that, we're going to um, hopefully push a uh, community policing plan and hopefully get funding for that so the community members of the north side of Minneapolis will be able to hopefully police themselves and um, remove that threat from our community. Awesome. Thank you so much. Rod, a uh, Rod Adams, everyone. Rod Adams. Adams. Rod Adams, everyone. Thank you so much. Please support um, making policemen get insurance, please. Please sign that petition also. That is very important. I want to make sure these guys get uninsured and get out of there. Thank you. Rod Adams is up today. Everyone, the drug budget.
never come down from the things I've seen. I never knew what not being young would mean, but now someday the ripples gonna hit the wall. Someday the ripples gonna hit the wall. Someday the ripples gonna hit the wall. And I know. Someday Be a dream date You don't even think of me when you were away Yeah, more Every day, the length of the streak is perverting your brain. 